Uh, all right, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight is going to be part six of our look at the Srimala Devi Simhanada Sutra, the lion's roar of Queen Srimala. Um, at this point, we're pretty, pretty deep in the sutra. Um, and the way this is starting to turn out is it's sort of kind of we're bridging chapters, meaning that tonight we're going to kind of basically finish chapter four and start chapter five. But we're actually going to take kind of a step back to the um, kind of a meaty, interesting part of chapter four that well, it's kind of one of those things about these sutras. You know, the, the, the ideas in these sutras, they really, they build off of each other. And, you know, most sutras are, they're kind of intended to be read in one sitting so that these accumulations sort of are fresh on your mind. <clears throat> so it makes it a little tricky when we take a week off and come back and a lot of these things aren't fresh on our mind. Um, and so I am going to take a little quick uh, jump back to kind of the midway point of chapter four. And that's mainly just to lay out the theme for tonight, because most of what I'm going to <clears throat> most of what I'm going to read, most of what we're going to be discussing, it all kind of centers around one idea, or actually I should say these four ideas that I've written on the board. So we're not though, we or we can't, we can't miss or forget about the big grand theme of this sutra. So the big grand theme of this sutra is this idea that Queen Srimala keeps talking about. She keeps talking about something called parigrahasa dharma, embracing the true dharma or accepting the correct dharma, being in harmony with the right or correct dharma. There's a few different ways to translate this idea of parigrahasa dharma, of, of being, yeah, in harmony or accepting in that way. Actually, I, I was debating whether I would do this, but I, I think it's on my mind, so I think I'm going to do it. I'm going to give us another way to think about this idea of parigraha sadharma, this idea of embracing the true dharma. So I've been struggling, not really struggling, but I've been playing with these different ways of translating this. You know, there's three steps three English translations of this sutra already. I'm working on my own. I'm trying to really figure out which word really works. Some translators translate it as embracing the true Dharma, others accepting. There's also this idea of receiving. And that's, an, that's kind of just, I wanted to just say this to sort of kind of create an image in your mind a little bit. So there's another way to think about this term or this idea of parigraha. I mentioned, you know, that you could translate it as harmonize. And the, the only problem with the idea of being in harmony with the correct dharma is that this word parigraha, it, it definitely kind of has a directionality to it which is this directionality of like receiving, accepting. It's like coming in, it's coming in, in that way. And so given that, I just kind of want you to kind of start to think about as an analogy, the idea of like a, a radio signal and a receiver, like an antenna. And so there's this kind of way in which there's this wave out there, a sound. Uh, you know, back in the old days of radio, it would have been a, maybe a single tone, right? And the idea is, is that that tone 
that note, that signal, as it's called, floating out there. But if there's an antenna there that's tuned just the right way to the right frequency, it can receive the signal. It can actually be a receiver. And so that idea of, of kind of like being in harmony with this signal so as to receive it, right? So if you're kind of even vaguely familiar with the idea of like the way radio antennas work in that sense, and that the antenna needs to be tuned to that frequency in order to then start to receive the message in that sense. All right. Maybe I'm being a little too overt in my right in order to receive the, the message. But anyways, I wanted to just paint that I that image in you in your mind that that's what we're kind of talking about is kind of being a receiver in that sense and embracing this kind of true dharma. Okay, so that's the grand theme of this sutra, and that's what uh, Srimala has come to tell us all about. And at this point in the sutra that we're at, which is chapter four, what we're doing is learning about, from Queen Srimala, we're learning about what it means for a virtuous man or a virtuous woman to be receiving of the correct dharma, be, being in harmony with the correct dharma, embracing the correct dharma, we're getting a feel for what that's all about. And so I wanted to return just to that part about um, um, the part from chapter four that was about these analogies that Queen Sri Mala laid out, that embracing the correct dharma, it's like that giant cloud of jewels at the beginning of a kalpa. It's like the giant flood at the beginning of the kalpa that brings up all the continents. And then she goes on to say this thing that one, a virtuous man, a virtuous woman who has embraced the correct dharma, that they, they sort of uh, support, they, these people support four kinds of practitioners. And just like the great earth, it says, she says, just like the great earth that supports all the mountains and all the trees and all the rivers and lakes and all the beings, in the same way, the bodhisattva, the virtuous man or virtuous woman who has embraced the correct dharma, supports those people seeking heavenly rewards, right? Deva punya, heavenly rewards. They support the shravakas, the voice hearers. They support the pratekyabuttas, the solitary enlightened ones. And they support the great vehicle, the Mahayana. So this is the first time in this sutra that it makes this kind of division into those seeking heavenly rewards, those seeking to be Shravakas, those seeking to be Pratakya Buddhas, and those seeking the Mahayana. And what we are to understand, if we kind of read between the lines, so to speak, we are to understand that the virtuous man or virtuous woman who has embraced the correct Dharma, in a sense, it says that for those who are interested in the, say, the solitary, enlightened path of a Pratakya Buddha, if that's what you're interested in, then you'll find all found out find out all about that. If that's what you're interested in, but if you're interested in being a shravaka, then this virtuous man or virtuous woman who has embraced the correct dharma, they'll tell you all about that path. And if you're just interested in heavenly rewards, they'll tell you all about that path. And of course, if you're interested in the Mahayana, they'll tell you all about that path too. This gets expounded upon in the next section where she describes these four treasuries, these vast treasuries that the bodhisattva receives, which are the same four types of people in that way, right? So 
in this way that this is the person who has embraced the correct dharma, <clears throat> I want to return to a very important moment that last Sunday we were just in kind of in the thick of talking about something else. And so I didn't even stop on it. I just kind of let it pass by. So I want to return to it because it's going to become the theme for tonight. So it involves these four, but let's hear a little bit more from Queen Srimala from chapter four. So what she goes on to say is, is that the good men and good women, the virtuous men and virtuous women who embrace the correct Dharma, they give their bodies, their lives, and their possessions for the sake of the correct dharma. By giving their bodies, these people will realize that which transcends the limits of samsara. They will be freed from old age and sickness, and they will attain the dharmakaya of a tathagata the reality body or the dharma body of a tathagata, which is indestructible, eternal, changeless, ultimately tranquil, and inconceivable. I want to pause there for a second. <clears throat> so in a sutra like this, I, needed, I, I want you to know that when they mention this dharmakaya, there's a way in which in this sutra, this should really pique our interest greatly. So where we're like, wait a minute, Srimala, what was that again about this dharma body? And so I'm going to just kind of, again, I want to work with this section really quickly to establish some themes for tonight. So the idea is, is that the virtuous men and women here that in embracing this correct dharma, they give their bodies, their lives, and ultimately their possessions. And, you know, this is where we kind of, or an idea that we ended with last time. And I didn't really have that much time last time to go into it. So I kind of glossed it very quickly. But, you know, I want to make very clear that, of course, that we are in no way talking kind of literally of giving one's life, giving, you know, in that sense, I kind of tried to make it clear that we're here, we're talking very much about attachment to the body, attachment to life, and attachment to possessions and stuff in that way. And so one reading of this is that this idea of these people giving up the body, life, and possessions, it's about letting go of that attachment of those things. And of course, you know, the idea of letting go of the attachments of the body, for example, are, are you know, there's a lot of different ways to cut this, but it's the idea of maybe letting go of the idea of the way one's body should be in that sense. Ideas of, of whether it's ideas of beauty or ugliness or these things, maybe those are to be let go of in that sense. But they could also be like ideas wrapped up around aging and all of these different things that are about attachment to the body. And so by liberating oneself of those attachments, of course, we're not talking about laying down in the railroad tracks and giving up one's life in that way. We're, we're talking about giving up that at specific attachment to it. Similar with life in that way, this is not about letting go of one's life, but it is about sort of letting go of that desperate attachment to life that maybe causes us fear, stress, anxiety in that way. And then belonging is, of course, the traditional way of giving up possessions would have been, of course, like actually giving them away. And that may very much be how this looks, but I would suggest that a, a starting point would be about relinquishing senses of ownership, senses of it is my X, Y, or Z, 
rather than just an, an X or a Y or a Z that I happen to be using at this particular moment. So there's kind of, you know, gradations in that sense to what it would mean to let go of possessions. But the key though, the key here is we find out that by giving up that, uh, the body in that way, you, someone who does that, will realize that which transcends the limits of samsara, will be freed from old age and sickness, and will attain this dharma body, not a physical rupa kaya, as it might be called, a body of form, but a dharma kaya. And this dharma kaya is indestructible, eternal, changeless, ultimately tranquil, and inconceivable. This is sort of new information, frankly, like especially in this sutra, we don't know about the Dharmakaya. And there's a way that this sutra kind of assumes you don't know about it. And at this particular moment where Srimala is saying, oh yeah, and by giving up the body, giving up life and possessions, you can attain this Dharmakaya that's eternal, changeless and inconceivable by giving up their lives, these people will realize that which transcends the limits of samsara, will be forever released from death, will attain eternity, and will acquire inconceivable merits. And they will also securely abide in all the Buddha dharmas and all miraculous powers. That sounds like a good exchange. I, I, you know, and then the third, by giving their possessions, they will also realize that which transcends the limits of samsara. They will go far beyond the realm of sentient beings. They will attain inexhaustible, indiminishing, perfect accomplishments and will acquire inconceivable merits and magnificent attributes honored and served by other sentient beings. All right. World honored one. The good men and good women who give their bodies, lives, and possessions in order to embrace the correct dharma will also receive the prophecy of enlightenment from the Buddha. Okay. So, I wanted to just remind us of a few of those themes. The first is going to be these four different kinds of practitioners. We're going to come back to that in a second. But then the, the real idea that I kind of wanted to lay out there was this Dharmakaya idea. This idea that by giving up the body, life, and possessions, we acquire or attain or reach to a state of this Dharmakaya. Now, I'm not going to go much further into it because, again, this is the kind of sutra that's planting a little seed here. It's a, a little seed of curiosity where, as a reader, you're supposed to be intrigued by this. And so we will find out more about this Dharmakaya momentarily. Let's now jump down to, uh, actually, this is going to be new territory. So that we all kind of talked about last time very quickly, but now we're going to get back to this kind of situation with these different kinds of practitioners. Um, maybe, yeah, let me, just because it's either now or later, so let's just do it now. Let's talk about these four kinds of practitioners really quickly. Um, so tonight's going to be interesting because we're going to kind of be doing two things. One thing is a lot of this, what we're going to be looking at tonight is very historical. And what I mean is, is that I often in, in the Dharma doors on Sunday nights, I often talk about how there's early Buddhism and later Buddhism. <laughs> and there's a lot of different names to divide those two periods, early and late, 
Hinayana, Mahayana, Shravakayana, Bodhisattva yana. There's all these different terminologies, but the kind of the main idea that I've tried to express is that historically, Buddhism as a tradition definitely went through a radical shift, a radical change. And what I've taken to saying lately is that it went from being a very austere meditation tradition to being a wisdom tradition. And it's not that the Mahayana as a wisdom tradition, it's not that there's not meditation. Absolutely, there's meditation. In fact, this later form of Buddhism, it's everything the early tradition was and more in that sense. So one of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight, and actually it's Srimala who's going to tell us all about it very in a very interesting way. But this sutra, at least the, the, the part I have outlined for us tonight, it's, ex it's exactly about this idea of moving from this rigorous, austere meditation tradition to a wisdom tradition. She's going to talk about it. So we're going to be talking historically about some changes Buddhism was going through. And historically, that has to do with these four different paths. All right. So these paths, and in fact, what I want to do tonight, because the, the real theme that we're going to eventually get to is this idea of the single vehicle, the ekyayana. So what I want to do is, is I actually want to put these four paths, these four ways of practicing, I want to put them in the language of the vehicles, this idea of a yana. So in Sanskrit, this would be a Y-A-N-A, -A, yana, which is a vehicle, could be any kind of vehicle, could have wheels, could have wings. It's not about that. It's about transport. It's about movement. It's about carrying in that sense. And the basic idea is, is that each of these is considered a yana, a vehicle. Now, of course, down at the last one, we have the great vehicle, the Mahayana. And that, of course, is a sutra like this, a tradition like this, this kind of Mahayana Buddhist tradition, the great vehicle. We're going to learn more about what that means, this great vehicle. We're going to learn more about that in a second. But let's talk quickly about these other three. So. Now, let me actually start with this one. What the sutra seems to be referencing when it talks about men and women seeking heavenly rewards. There's a lot of ways that you could think about this. The, the simplest, simplest, simplest way to think about this is the first one is it's about people trying to do good who want to do good. There's a lot of people out there that maybe are ambiguous about good and bad. And so they're off pursuing pleasures that other people call bad and they're kind of whatever. But maybe there's somebody who's actually said, you know what? I don't think violence is good. I don't think harm is good. I don't think lying is good. I don't think stealing is good. I don't think any of that is actually good. I want to practice goodness. And, and so someone who has kind of made a concerted effort to, quote, be a better person or be a good person, that would be one way of understanding that first category, right? But I want to go a little further with this idea of the seeking heavenly rewards. So since we're talking about vehicles, yanas, this first... Uh, seeking heavenly rewards idea, there's an interesting yana. There's an interesting vehicle that I want to tell you about. You may have heard of this yana, um, or it might ring a bell, 
But in, in India, in the Sanskrit language, there is an ancient epic poem called the Ramayana, the Ramayana. And that's a yana. That is also a vehicle, but it's the vehicle of a god named Rama. So Ram Rama is an incarnation of Vishnu, and you can learn all about this particular incarnation, this particular avatar. You can learn about Rama from this epic poem, the Ramayana. And the basic idea is, is that Rama, as an avatar of Vishnu, is kind of God, like the divine force in that sense. And Rama wants you to do good. <laughs> Rama wants you to go to heaven. Rama wants you to have a better rebirth. Rama wants the virtuous in that sense. So Rama is a god like any other god in that sense that we're, would really like you to do good. And there's also a sense in which the, the tradition of Rama is a tradition of devotion, absolutely a tradition of chanting, chanting the name of Rama. And the idea is, is that if you get into chanting the name of Rama, and you get into reading the Ramayana, and you get into doing good for the sake of Rama, and you go do Rama things, Rama pujas and all of that, you could say that you're on the Ramayana. You're on the Rama vehicle. And you're riding the Rama Express <laughs> to liberation. So what I'm getting at is, is one way to understand the first one of these categories is kind of paths of purity, paths of discipline that aren't Buddhist, but are virtuous nonetheless, that are noble nonetheless in that sense. And so I choose the Rama tradition just for that idea of the Ramayana versus somebody that might want to step up and ride the Shravaka Yana. And so I do want you to know that there is a term, Shravaka Yana. It is basically synonymous with Hinayana. The thing about Hinayana, of course, means the little vehicle. That's in contrast to the great vehicle. But whether you call it the Hinayana or the Shravakayana, the point of this, so the point of this second path is basically to be a monk or a nun. That's essentially what it would mean to be a Shravaka. Now, I mentioned last week that this word Shravaka means a voice hearer, and what that term originally meant was that Shravakas were people that actually heard the Buddha. They actually heard the Buddha speak. But there's a way that in a sutra like this, a shravaka, it means a monastic. Like, that's like very much what it means. Somebody who is shaving their head, wearing robes, is celibate, homeless, begs for food, all of that. That's the shravaka yana. And the reason why that's traditionally, at least in the Mahayana, the reason why that's traditionally called the little vehicle is because it's such an austere, difficult path that really only a handful of us kind of have the chutzpah to do that in that sense. It's a very rough, difficult path in that way. So that would be the Shravakayana to not only seek virtue, but to do it in the Buddhist way, but to do it in the original old school Buddhist way of being a monastic. There is also something called the Pratekya Buddha Yana, the vehicle of the solitary enlightened. Now, in, in the kind of the general scheme of things, a Pratekya Buddha is a Buddha, is an, an awakened being, is an enlightened being. But the reason why they're referred to as a solitary uh, Buddha 
a solitary enlightened one is because the idea is, is that they basically go off alone and achieve the goal, realize enlightenment, uh, attain nirvana, but then they just hang out. <laughs> they don't tell anybody about it, particularly the idea is, is that they don't necessarily have a system or a method to explain it to other people. And so they are truly awakened, no doubt about it. But they're kind of that rough and rugged individual that's out there doing it alone in that sense. Whereas the Shravakas are in Sangha, they are in community and living in community and practicing in community, but they're practicing again this very austere path. Pratekya Buddhas are practicing the same austere path, but in a solitary environment and actually achieving kind of the goal of Buddhism in that sense. Then you get to the Mahayana that's all about the Bodhisattva and pretty much this whole sutra is about explaining that Mahayana. So those are those four and those are the four as they, well, as they existed historically. And, you know, I kind of in the opening night of this sutra, I kind of articulated or I tried to explain when this sutra probably was from, right? And it's a very, very old sutra, probably not from the mouth of the Buddha, probably not from 500 BC, probably closer to 100 BC, maybe even 100 AD still very, 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 very old in terms of where we're at. Um, but so my point is, is that this is a very old, very early Mahayana Sutra in that sense. And so the ideas that it's dealing with are dealing with that, well, that moment in Buddhist history where seemingly, if we read this Sutra correctly, Buddhism was fracturing into different paths in that way. That's what this sort of sutra is dealing with. So that's one thing I wanna talk about tonight, which is the historical con uh, context of this sutra. But I don't want this to just be historical. These four categories very much, actually, I actually wanna even add the fifth category, these categories, they have a lot to do with the modern world as well. So I also want to make tonight's uh, reading and tonight's, tonight's talk, I want to make it applicable to the world that we're living in. And so, of course, the Shravakas are still around. The Theravada Buddhist tradition is alive and well. And that Theravada tradition of Southeast Asia, the Thai forest tradition, the tradition from Sri Lanka, they are very much about the monastic path. That is how you do Buddhism. And so they are kind of practicing the Shravakayana. And there's a lot of American English-based Buddhist communities that are based on the Pali Canon, based on the tradition of the elders, meaning based on the Theras, and, well, uh, yeah, I guess what I mean to say is, is that there, the opposition between Mahayana Buddhism and Shravakayana Buddhism is alive and well in the world today. <laughs> and it, it's not necessarily that they're at odds at, with one another, but they are sort of teaching two different styles of Buddhism. One is very monastic and very meditation-based, the Mahayana tradition is a little more socially engaged and more compassion-based. We're going to get to that as soon as I start reading. But, okay, so I just want to make that clear, that this is very much talking about a historical moment in the transition of Buddhism, but these things are still very much alive and well, including something like a Pratekya Buddha, you know, and the, there's a lot of these. I've met them on the road, you know, and they're out there. These solitary enlightened beings are still out there. 
And it's because, you know, this is Dharma, this is truth, it's available for people to understand it. And so, you know, I don't necessarily like to name names in that way. But there are these kind of forest dwelling solitary enlightened beings that are out in the world today and it's a path okay um and of course the mahayana is a path and of course what i want to get at is this first category of seeking heavenly rewards again this could be any religious tradition this could be christianity judaism islam baha'i you name it and so that would be a way to contextualize uh, tonight's reading in the modern world or to get you ready for it. Because I haven't actually even really talked about what this, what the message tonight is all about. Okay. Everybody ready? It's a very, very long introduction. Apologies for that. So here's some new information. Here's some new words of wisdom from Srimala. This is further explanation of what it's like for a virtuous man or virtuous woman who has embraced the correct dharma. World honored one. When the correct dharma is on the verge of extinction in the world and the monks, the nuns, laymen and lay women will gather in groups and start to form factions, and they will dispute with one another. At that time, the good men and virtuous women who are without crookedness or deceit, who cherish and embrace the correct dharma, they will associate with those factions. Those who associate with the good factions will definitely receive the Buddha's prophecy of attaining enlightenment. Okay, so I wanted to stop there. So that idea of the, the embracer of the correct Dharma, um, I'm actually want to reread that from the other translation, which I liked a little bit better. So this one says, and it, yeah, it's, it's more interesting the way uh, Diana Paul translates it. So she says, furthermore, world honored one, virtuous men and virtuous women who accept the true Dharma without distortion and without deception or misrepresentation will love the true Dharma and accept the true Dharma. Entering into Dharma friendship when the monks, nuns, lay men, and lay women are forming rival factions that cause the destruction and dispersion of the Sangha. Those who enter into Dharma friendship will certainly receive the prophecy of the Buddha. <clears throat> so I just wanted to point out, so that idea of this person who has ex accepted the correct dharma, that they go into these factional situations and create dharma friendship, right? I wanna kind of remind you of that beautiful part earlier on where it also described the person who accepts the true dharma as being greatly compassionate, great, a great comforter, sympathizer with all living beings, Dharma mother of the world, right? So that was from before. And then we learned about the uh, creating Dharma friendships, right? Regarding this shift to Mahayana Buddhism, in the early Buddhist tradition, the what would be called the Shravakayana, you really don't hear these types of things. <laughs> Meaning that the, the, the Arhat, the Buddhist monk, is not actually encouraged to be the greatly compassionate, a great comforter, 
sympathizer of all living beings, and you certainly do not hear them being described as the Dharma mother of the world. And you also really don't hear language like that other part about creating Dharma friendships in that way. This is a different practice. And again, this is what you know, Thich Nhat Hanh calls socially engaged Buddhism. It's a great example of it, actually, this idea of going into factional situations and using, and actually the, the Chinese um, actually says it's using the correct Dharma to create Dharma friendships. So it's this, this beautiful idea of going into a situation where, hey, we're all Buddhist here. We're all, we're all into the Dharma and trying to create that kind of cohesion, right? Again, this is a new practice. This is a new angle on this. Okay. So let me just finish off this uh, last little part of chapter four. World honored one. I see that the embracing of the true Dharma has such tremendous power the thus come one, the Tathagata, regards this correct dharma as the eye of the dharma, the basis of all dharma, the guide of the dharma, and the understanding of the dharma. Then the world honored one, having heard Queen Srimala explain the great power of embracing the correct dharma, exclaimed, so it is, so it is. Excellent, Sri Mala. It is just as you say, to embrace the correct Dharma has tremendous, awesome power. A person will feel, a person would feel great pain or even become severely ill when one of their vulnerable spots is touched even slightly by a strong man. In the same way, Srimala, Mara, the evil one, feels excruciating pain, worry, distress, and howls and moans with woe when someone embraces even a small portion of the correct Dharma. Srimala, I have never seen any other dharma cause Mara to worry as much as the slightest amount of embracing the correct dharma. Srimala, just as the king of cattle is more beautiful in form and color and larger in size than any other cattle, so too, Srimala, one who practices the Mahayana even if they embrace only a small portion of the correct dharma, is superior to the Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas with all of their wholesome dharmas. Srimala, Mount Sumaru, the king of mountains, surpasses all other mountains in height, breadth, and beauty. In the same way, Srimala, a novice in the Mahayana who, in order to benefit others, embraces the correct Dharma without regard for their life or limb is superior to a person who has long been abiding in the Mahayana, but who has always concerned with their body and life. Therefore, Srimala, you should reveal demonstrate and teach the embracing of the correct dharma to all sentient beings. Thus, Srimala, to embrace the correct dharma yields great blessings, benefits, and great karmic fruits. Srimala, although for innumerable incalculable kalpas, I have praised the merits of embracing the correct dharma, I have not exhausted them yet. Therefore, to embrace the correct Dharma brings about infinite rewards. 
Okay, that's the end of chapter four. Is everybody with me? Yeah? Okay. It, it really is just getting good. It's just getting warmed up. Really, really, truly. Um, I just wanted to point out one interesting thing. Um, it, it was one of, it's one of those things that jumped out at me when I first read this. And then as I was reading it now, it jumped out, you know, because I kind of imagine how you're all hearing this. And so it jumped out at me and it kind of confirms that there is a very interesting masculine feminine thing going on in this sutra. And, and it's not, I think, in an oppositional way. I actually think it's in a kind of dance. And so interesting, the Buddha's three examples, very interesting. He says that it's like a strong man who touches just a vital point and can cause great pain, right? He says it's like the king of bulls, right? The king of cattle and like the king of mountains, right? Mount Maru, right? So those are three very masculine, yang, if I were to use the yin and yang Chinese kind of cosmology, very masculine, very young examples. And I think it's a very interesting, again, it's kind of a dance that goes on between Srimala, feminine, and the Buddha, kind of masculine in that way. And so just wanted to point that out about those examples. There's a lot more going on too with that, the masculine feminine in that way too, uh, that I'll try to remember to point out as it pops up, because I think it's kind of uh, very interesting. So, okay. So, everybody good? Excellent. Chapter five. All right. So, we need to start by talking about the title of chapter five. So, the title of chapter five is this Ekyayana, the single vehicle. And I promised myself I wasn't going to do the thing where I treat this like a mystery and I don't tell you things. So I'm not gonna do that. So we're gonna talk about the ekyayana, the single vehicle. The basic idea of the single vehicle, this, this kind of idea, this Buddhist idea, it's the idea that actually the Mahayana, the Pratyeka Buddha vehicle and the solitary enlightened vehicle, or sorry, and the Shravaka vehicle, and even the other vehicles, it's all one vehicle. If you've heard, you have probably heard that kind of beautiful analogy of one mountain, many paths to the top, right? It's kind of a classic example of this idea that all these traditions, all these ideas, they're all headed to the same place. And they use maybe different language, different practices, different this, different that, wear different clothes, what have you. But they're just different paths going to the same mountaintop in that way. That idea is what the Ekyayana is kind of all about, is that even though there are these different teachings, it's all the same teaching in that way. And what I want you to know is that the arising of this idea of the one vehicle, it seems to have come from Buddhism starting to split into two vehicles, into traditions or sects, as the sutra says, factions, rival factions, and all of that. And so, you know, more in a way than just this idea of embracing the correct dharma is not just about embracing the correct teaching in that way. It's very much about this kind of disposition of acceptance, this disposition, disposition of embracing and not leaving anything out in that way. It's kind of all inclusive in that sense. Um, so that's the basic idea of this single vehicle. 
Now, where this gets a little tricky is when, and yeah, I wanna say this, but it kind of comes up, but I think I should say this to start. This starts to get a little tricky because the single vehicle, the ekyayana, it's, it's usually, it is, equated with the Mahayana. <laughs> like the Mahayana is the one vehicle. It is the great vehicle. It includes all the other vehicles, including the Mahayana. So it, it kind of, the sutra is going to get a little self-referential that way. And I just want you to know it's kind of intentional in that sense. So uh, just be aware of that. Um, okay, so let's find out from Queen Srimala herself. Let's find out all about this single vehicle. Um, yeah, and we're about to go really, really deep in, yeah, it's right from the beginning. So we're about to go really, really deep into the difference between the Shravakas, the Pratyeka Bhuttas, and the Bodhisattva path. We're, we're going to start to get into the, the weeds, so to speak, of all that. So the Buddha told Sri Mala, you should, uh, you should now explain further the accepting or embracing of the true Dharma, which I have taught and which is cherished by all the Buddhas. Sri Mala said, very well. World honored one. The embracing of the correct dharma is called the Mahayana. And why? Because the Mahayana gives birth to all the Shravakas and Pratyeka Bhuttas and gives birth to all the mundane and super mundane wholesome dharmas of the Bodhisattvas. Just as the heatless lake Anavatapta is the source of the eight rivers of the world, so too the Mahayana produces all Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas and all the mundane and super mundane wholesome dharmas of all bodhisattvas. World Honored One just as all seeds, grasses, trees, and forests depend upon the great earth in order to grow, so too all shravakas and pratyeka bhuttas and all mundane and super mundane wholesome dharmas of the bodhisattvas depend upon the Mahayana in order to grow. Therefore, world honored one, to abide in and embrace the Mahayana is to abide in and embrace the vehicles of the Shravakas and Pratyakya Bhuttas and all the mundane and super mundane wholesome dharmas of the Bodhisattvas. Okay, that's kind of the end of section one. Mahayana is the mother, is the in a way, the supporter origin of the Shravaka path and the Pratyakya Bhutta path. We're going to learn more about that in a second. But now we're going to start to get into some kind of technical stuff. So bear with me and definitely anybody stop me if things get too confusing. Srimala said, the Bhutta the world honored one has discoursed on six subjects, namely the abiding of the correct Dharma, the extinction of the correct Dharma, the Pratimoksha, the Vinaya, true renunciation of the household life, and sixth, full monastic ordination. It is for the sake of the Mahayana that these six subjects 
have been taught by the Buddha. What does that mean? How so? Well, the first one is this idea of the abiding of the correct Dharma, that there is correct Dharma in the world, right? The abiding, I'm reading further, the abiding of the correct Dharma in the world is taught for the sake of the Mahayana because the abiding of the Mahayana is the abiding of the correct Dharma. <laughs> the extinction of the correct Dharma is taught for the sake of the Mahayana because the extinction of the Mahayana is the extinction of the true Dharma. Okay, I'm gonna pause there one second. I'm gonna clarify what's going on. So th this is the second time it, it's referenced this. So when I read the part about the Bodhisattva going into the rival factions, that section began by saying, when the correct Dharma is on the verge of extinction. And then we just read, or we just heard also about this idea of the extinction of the correct Dharma. So if you haven't heard this before, it is a part of the Buddhist tradition. And it has always been a part of the Buddhist tradition. In fact, there's a sutra where the Buddha made this prediction in this way. And basically the prediction was that his true correct Dharma, the, his real message, like the real point that he was trying to get across, the correct Dharma, the Buddha made a prediction that that correct teaching would actually only last in the world for 500 years. And that after 500 years, due to translation, due to corruption, due to all kinds of factors, the message of the true Dharma would start to get kind of diluted a little bit, di diluted a little bit. And eventually, after another 500 years would be extinct completely. But the real true teaching the Buddha said it was only going to be around for 500 years, and then it was going to be a little dodgy, and you'd actually have to really sift through a bunch of stuff to find the true Dharma, and then it would actually eventually disappear entirely. So this is kind of a part of the Buddhist tradition, and it's what's being referenced here. So when it said that upon the extinction of the true Dharma, when there's factions and fighting among the, the monks and nuns, that's what the Buddha said would happen when the true Dharma went extinct, is that these factions would start fighting with one another. And then here, it actually says that, and it's doing this kind of really, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing, but where it's saying that the abiding of the true Dharma is the Mahayana. That's like what the Mahayana is, is the real message of the Buddha. And so the extinction of the Mahayana, that's the extinction of the correct Dharma in that way. That's the first message. Regard so we're talking about six things. Those were the first two. The next two things, something called Pratimoksha and something called the Vinaya. So Srimala is kind of reformulating some basic Buddhist ideas, some basic Buddhist teachings in that way. And if I may, I'll just read from the sutra. And it says, as for the Pratimoksha and the Vinaya, these two dharmas differ in name, but they mean the same thing. And indeed they do more or less mean the same thing. You probably know the Vinaya, the Vinaya. And the Vinaya, that word Vinaya means discipline. <clears throat> it's the discipline. And the Vinaya is this 
collection of teachings of the Buddha on the monastic way of life. That's what the Vinaya is. It is all of the stories about monasticism and it's the, the Vinaya. The Vinaya is all of the backstory to how the 220, 225 rules for being a monastic, the Vinaya are all the stories of how those rules came to be. This word pratimoksha, which means um, towards moksha, towards liberation, the pratimoksha is just the list of 220, 225 rules that are extracted from the Vinaya. But traditionally, on the new moon and the full moon, Buddhist monastic communities would get together. So every two weeks, fortnightly, they would get together and they would recite the Pratimoksha, all of the rules. They wouldn't recite the entire Vinaya. That would actually take days and days to do. They recite the 200 and so however many rules, and that's the Pratimoksha. So those are two of the things that the Buddha originally established. The rules and, you know, the logic or behind the rules. Srimala says, huh, she says, as for the Pratimoksha rules and the Vinaya discipline, these two dharmas differ in name, but they mean the same thing. Vinaya is instruction for the Mahayana. How's that? It is for the sake of Buddhahood, which is the aim of the Mahayana, that one leaves the household life and receives their full monastic ordination. Therefore, the Vinaya, true renunciation of the household life, and the full monastic ordination are all Mahayana disciplines. So they snuck in the last two. So the, the last two were the idea of leaving home and taking full ordination as a monk or a nun. So that, that's those six steps the true dharma, the extinction of the true dharma, the pratimoksha, the vinaya, and then these last two ideas of leaving home and taking full ordination. She's kind of describing the shravaka path. She's describing the Hinayana monastic path, but she's putting it in this new Mahayana light. And she's actually saying that actually it's all because of the Mahayana that all of these things exist, not for the Shravakayana, but for the Mahayana. It's about to get really heavy. So is everybody with me? Yeah, no. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about the, this idea that in 500 years, the Buddha's teachings will be uh, will be dissipated or will cease to have their original meaning because I guess of people kind of losing track of what he really said. I'm, I'm making that up. Um, and you said that this, this particular sutra was probably written or said at about 500 years after the Buddha was alive so what 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 does that mean is that also self-referential is it is she saying that the original meaning of the buddha is now being rethought with then that's what the mahayana is or what what's the significance of that um i think without going too deep into that idea i think what uh, if I were to just interpret it, I would suggest that Sri Mala, the let's or the author of this sutra, however you want to look at it, 
is taking an old Buddhist idea and prophecy, which is about the decline of the Dharma. And she's reworking that into a new Mahayana framework where she's saying that the true Dharma that the Buddha prophesied would decline, that's the Mahayana. And so as long as there is the Mahayana, then there's the true Dharma. But when, if we lose the Mahayana, that will be the extinction of the Buddha's true teaching. And your, your chronology, Noam, putting those things and saying, wait a minute, isn't this sutra from about the time period is exactly right. It was very much in the air at the time that this was written, that like we are at the time period that the Buddha talked about. And, you know, the Buddha seemingly in making that prophecy in that way, he, I mean, if I could make a joke, a bad joke, he was kind of like, hey, you, you guys ever played the telephone game, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's going to be like that. <laughs> and it's going to take 500 years for the telephone line to break down, yeah. basically. But according to Srimala, that's not you know, necessarily the case in that way. But she hasn't yet told us how or why, right? No. She's going to. Yes, but it's going to be one of those things like a great suture where it'll happen and you won't even know it happened. And you'll look back and you'll be like, oh, wait. Okay. But yeah, exactly. Okay. So, yeah, I really know, I really just want everyone to know that she is responding to this idea, this established idea that the Dharma was going to decline. Yeah. Okay. So now we get to the very, 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 very interesting part. Everything up till now, <laughs> a long introduction. Everything has actually been introductory to this moment of the sutra. So this is where we start to get into the real, like, Sri Mala commentary on the Shravakas and the Pratekya Bhuttas, all right? She says, and th this is like, radical this is like really like whoa did she just say that world honored one arhats and by the way if you don't know arhats are the shravakas these fully enlightened beings of the early school of the early path world honored one arhats don't truly leave their household life or receive full monastic ordination. Why? Because it is not for the sake of Buddhahood that they leave the household life or receive full ordination. The Arhats take refuge in the Tathagata out of fear. How's that? Arhats are constantly afraid of all phenomena, as if someone were coming to attack them with a sword. Therefore, they do not actually accomplish the deeds of renunciation, and nor do they attain ultimate bliss. World Honored One, a refuge does not seek refuge. Just as sentient beings without refuge are afraid of being without a refuge and they seek refuge for the sake of security and peace, so too, world honored one, the arhats take refuge in the Tathagata out of fear. All right, I can't let that great line go by without addressing it. I got to tell you, like, in the Chinese, it's, it's just as like beautiful and it's just right there. She says this world honored one, a refuge does not seek refuge. 
it's it's a beautiful statement. I mean, it's both very like prana wisdom, but it's also uh, it's why I wanted to go all the way back to the Dharma mother of the world line because that's very much kind of what she's talking about. This idea of a bodhisattva or somebody seeking the full Buddhahood, they are a refuge. They don't seek refuge. But in particular, it's interesting what she's describing here, this idea of arhat seeking refuge out of fear. And then something also that I I find myself uh, teaching a lot, or not teaching, but saying a lot, that beautiful line, or not beautiful, but that interesting line about how, um, and actually, I was working on my translation, and it actually says that the arhats abide, so it's a, a reference to their meditation practice, the arhats abide constantly afraid of all phenomena, like someone with a sword was coming to get them. That's kind of a reference I make a lot to one of the things that makes early Buddhism early Buddhism is something called the three marks of existence, that all things are impermanent and all things are a source of suffering and all things are without a self. But it's that second one, viewing all phenomena as a source of suffering. That's kind of a hallmark of Hinayana, of the early path. Keep all worldly phenomena at bay. And ultimately the idea is, is that, well, at least in Sri Mala's opinion, these arhats like are afraid of the world. They're afraid of getting immersed in the world. And so their practice is one of constantly being in fear of phenomena. And I think that that's a very interesting critique of that path of the the earlier school. And she says, because the arhats seek refuge in the Buddha out of fear, she says, thus world honored one, arhats and pratekya buddhas have not ended their rebirthing. They have not sufficiently cultivated pure conduct. They have not accomplished what should be accomplished, and they have not completely eradicated what should be eradicated. They are still very far from nirvana. How so? Only the thus come one, the tathagata, worthy one, perfectly enlightened one, attains final nirvana, has achieved all the infinite, inconceivable merits. Has Only the Tathagata has eradicated all that should be eradicated, is ultimately pure, is adorned by, or is adored by all sentient beings, and has transcended the states of the two vehicles, Shravaka, Pratekya Buddha, and the vehicle of the Bodhisattva. The Arhats, Pratekya Buddhas and so forth, they have not done so. It is only as an upaya, as a skillful means, that the Buddha speaks of Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas as having attained nirvana. Therefore, they are still very far from nirvana. (laughs) World honored one. When the thus come one says that the arhats and pratyakya buddhas have an insight into liberation, thoroughly possess the four knowledges, and have attained ultimate relief and rest, he was speaking upayakly, expediently, in order to accommodate others' inclinations. How's that? There are actually, she says, two kinds of death. What are the two kinds of death? The ordinary recurring death. Oh, sorry. There is ordinary recurring death of sentient beings who continue existence in samsara. 
and there is the transformational death. I'm sorry, the, the translation here is tricky and I wanna get this right. And there is the transformational death of my, when I say it, finally you're gonna be like, okay, okay. There is the transformational death. Man, it's so tricky. All right, I'm just gonna say it. I'm gonna scream mincing words. And there is the transformational death of the mind-created bodies of arhats, pratekya buddhas, and fully liberated bodhisattvas, which they retain until they attain awakening, bodhi. Now, of the two kinds of death I just mentioned, it is with regard to the ordinary recurring death that arhats and pratekya buddhas are said to know that they have exhausted all their rebirths because they have realized the incomplete fruit they are said to know they have fully cultivated pure conduct because they have thoroughly eradicated the continuous defilements which cannot be accomplished by any ordinary people or even by the seven grades of students, they are said to know that they have accomplished what should be accomplished. World Honored One, to say that arhats and pratekya bhutas know they are no more subject to future existence does not mean that they have eradicated all their defilements or that they know all of their rebirths are over. How's that? Arhats and Pratekya Bhuttas still have some defilements not yet eradicated. Therefore, they cannot know all their, all their rebirths are finished. Everybody with me? No questions or comments yet? No questions about man, mind made bodies. Yeah, Tanya. Well, yeah, mind made bodies. And then I was just thinking, like, you know, here she's saying, oh, you know, all these four paths are under Mahayana. And then now, like, uh, it seems like then she's like kind of now saying that, um, you know, they're, they're not in a sense, right? Because Mahayana is better, like Bodhisattva is better. Like, uh, maybe I'm missing something. It seems like, yep. like maybe she's throwing them under the bus a little bit. <laughs> but maybe I'm like, you know. Oh yeah, oh, she's throwing them under the bus, all right. That's, that's for <laughs> sure. But it's not contradictory to the earlier statement. So they're all included in the Mahayana. Mm -hmm. But now she's pointing out the shortcomings of those vehicles. Okay, yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's weird because like, Maha, if they're part of Mahayana and, Ma, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just getting stuck on the language. It's okay. Oh, yeah, what, yeah. What were you going to say about the mind bodies? Oh, so... You know, the creation of mind-made bodies is something that doesn't get talked about that often, even though it's a very big part of the path. Um, so even if you go back, um, one of the main sutras that talks about it is the fruits of the homeless life, the Shramanapala Sutta. But as early as that sutta, which is a very, very old, very early Theravada Sutta, the Buddha describes through the practice of dhyana, through the four dhyanic states, one establishes what is called a mind-made body, and they actually transfer their consciousness out of this physical body and into that mind-made body. That transference is an important part of the process, the, the path of purification, as it might be called. And what 
and I'm hoping that we can, oh, actually we're very close to exactly where I wanted to get tonight. So this is good. But the idea here is, is this is this is new information again, by the way, that there's two kinds of death. Yeah, this is news. So Srimala is dropping all kinds of new information on us. And the, basically the thing that she's kind of talking about is how the arhats, pratyakya buddhas, and even the bodhisattvas, they end samsaric rebirth and they transcend the, the death of the physical body by creating these mind-made bodies and transferring their consciousness into them and basically getting very good at that until they abide solely in that mind-made body. And in that way, they transcend mortality. We are to understand. But what Srimala is saying is, oh, but they're just transcending and escaping the regular old ordinary death. The regular old, you know, like normal funerals and birthdays and like the normal rebirth. What she's then laying out, though, is that there's a, a kind of a birth and death of a higher order of some sort. And again, it's why I wanted to go back and reference a few things. This has to do with that inconceivable, immutable Dharma Kaya, that Dharma body. That's where we're kind of headed is towards a better understanding of the Dharma Kaya and what it would mean to fully embody that Dharma Kaya. That's what Sri Mala wants us to get to. And this idea of the ego body self and obsession with transcending the, the limitations of the physical body and then eventually getting out of the death and rebirth of this situation, Srimal is saying that's like kindergarten <laughs> doing that in that way. And that's the idea that she's about to get into this idea. And I'm hoping, yeah. So let me just read this really quickly so I can finish where I wanted to get to tonight because I want to set up the theme for next week. So she says, world honored one. To say that arhats and pratyeka buddhas know that they are no more subject to future existence does not mean that they have eradicated all defilements or that they know all their rebirths are finished. How's that? Arhats and pratyeka buddhas still have some residual defilements not yet eradicated. Therefore, they cannot know that all their births are, are finished. There are two kinds of defilements. Underlying defilements and active defilements. The underlying defilements are four in number. What are they? Attachment to a particular point of view, a drishti. Attachment to kama, sensual pleasure. Attachment to rupa, form. And the craving for existence. World honored one. These four underlying defilements can produce all active defilements, like anger, greed, delusion, the active kleshas, the active defilements. They are all arising because of these underlying defilements of attachment to a point of view or a drishti, attachment to sensual pleasures, attachment to form, and even the craving for existence. The active defilements arise from moment to moment in tandem with the mind. World honored one. The underlying defilement of ignorance 
avidya never arises along with the mind from beginningless time. World honored one, the four underlying defilements, attachment to a point of view, attachment to sensual pleasure, attachment to form and the craving for existence, those are powerful. They can breed all active defilements, yet in comparison with them, the underlying defilement of ignorance is so much more powerful that the difference is inexpressible, either in figures, charts, or analogies. <laughs> Thus, world honored one, the underlying defilement of ignorance is more powerful than the craving for existence. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. So we just got introduced, we just got introduced to the next theme for next Sunday, which is the underlying defilement of ignorance, avidya, which she says, it's stronger than any of these, right? I'm glad we got there because that is what I meant by Buddhism moving from an austere meditation tradition that's about directly trying to stop active defilements and moving to the Mahayana, which is focused on ignorance. And the idea is, is that if you can cut off the root cause, which is ignorance, everything else will follow in that way. And that, so that is what we're going to get into deep next Sunday. But I also just want to emphasize that that's what I keep talking about when I talk about Buddhism moving to becoming a wisdom tradition, it's the same tradition. It's the same teaching. It's the same, um, what can I say? It's the alleviation of suffering. Buddhism is always about alleviating dukkha. It's what it's always about. It's just that in the Mahayana, they kind of have realized, oh, if we go deeper to the root cause of it all, and nip it in the bud, you won't even have these other active defilements coming about. And so the practice of a sutra like this is about wisdom, it's about pranya, it's about that understanding that can cut off all the other defilements. And so if that sounds good, then you should come back next Sunday <laughs> where we will continue reading uh, chapter five. All right. That's it for me, folks. I'm going to pass it over to Noam. Thank you.